in the program, too. But uh, I'm David Williamson Schaefer. I'm a, a professor at the University of Wisconsin, uh, where I study uh, games and learning. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, actually, that, uh, that Tony and Chuck aren't here, because, of course, you, you sort of hate to talk about somebody behind their back, as it were. Um, but I was very struck by uh, some of the figures that were in uh, Tony's presentation, and also some of the ones that were not in there. Um, this figure is particularly striking. So 75% of uh, high-level managers at IBM, including those who uh, play uh, massively multiplayer online games, um, think that the environmental factors within the game can en enhance leadership effectiveness. So they're talking about things like this, um, applying virtual communications and tools and facilitation techniques to management, using collaborative spaces more in, in uh, corporate management, communicating where the organization needs to go. These things that we see that work well in online games are good ideas for managing a company too. But I'm also struck by this statistic, which wasn't quite in Tony's report, although if you read it carefully it was. So he said 39% of, of these players said that they could learn how to do these things from games. That also means that 61% of them said they couldn't. Um, and, it, and it's interesting to think a little bit about why it is that all these good principles of management are in the game, and yet 61% of the people who play these games and are, man are successful managers don't think that they could learn very well from the games. Um, Tony showed this graph, which he said shows that, in fact, the um, relevant or highly relevant skills of management in a game are related to the relevant and highly relevant skills of being a corporate manager. Uh, but unfortunately, if you look carefully at this graph, there are some funny things happening. Notice the axes, which start on the one hand at 75 and go to 100, and the other hand start at 50 and go to 100. And notice there's that one little outlier that Tony pointed out. So his claim was that the red and the black skills, visioning and collaboration, are in fact very highly associated in both games and with managers. Well, I, I took the liberty of taking these, the same data here and just re-representing it on a kind of more normal graph, and I threw away the outlier, and it looks like this. <laughs> now, it's certainly true that there are a lot of skills in the game that are also skills of being a corporate manager. Um, that's why they're both, they're all both up in the upper right-hand corner. But there's no correlation at all. There isn't a systematic relationship. The things that are emphasized in the game aren't necessarily the same things that are emphasized in the corporate setting. Um, and so what I'd like to do is just quickly um, give you a sense of, of how we could think about this in a slightly different way, that not to say that these environments are bad, but to think about a way to make them more effective, not only for exemplifying practices, but for actually getting people to understand them and be able to use them. Um, now, I'll confess, I don't actually study leadership per se, but I do study um, innovative practices, um, things like engineering and architecture and medicine and law, places where people solve problems that don't have standardized answers, where they have to think in innovative and creative ways. Um, and, it, and sure enough, people who think in innovative and creative ways have to know certain things, right? They have to have a body of knowledge. If you're an engineer, you have to know building codes, for example. Um, they also have to have certain skills. They have to be able to do stuff. As an engineer, you have to be able to use uh, particular software to do your designs. You have to be able to solve particular kinds of problems. If you're a leader, obviously, you need skills and collaboration and so forth. Um, but knowledge and skills aren't enough. Those, the knowledge and skills that go into any kind of innovative or creative thinking also have to be linked with values. You have to care about things in a particular way in order to use those knowledge and skills appropriately. And they have to be tied with an identity. You have to see yourself as the kind of person who has those values, who uses those skills, the skills and knowledge in pursuit of those values. But even all of those things, knowledge, skills, values, and identity, aren't enough to explain the kind of thinking that we value in a company like IBM. Um, we also need this, epistemology, which is a fancy Greek word. It just means a particular way of making decisions or justifying actions. It's about how we know what we know. In the work that I do, I, you can th I think about this collection of knowledge and skills and values and identity and epistemology is what I call an epistemic frame. It's like a pair of glasses that you put on and it colors the world in a particular way. It's how you see the world from one perspective and not another. How you decide one set of things are important and not another. How you make one kind of decision and not another. 
Well, it turns out we actually know a lot about how people develop these kinds of frames. Um, that is, how they learn innovative and creative thinking. And I'm borrowing here from the work of Don, uh, late Don Schoen at MIT, um, who talked about something called reflection in action. It's a particular kind of thinking um, that people who solve problems that don't have routine answers do. Um, and Schoen's argument was that reflection and action is, the ability, is thinking that reshapes what we're doing while we're doing it. In other words, innovative thinkers literally link ways of knowing with ways of doing. And this linkage gets made in a professional practicum. You can think of a practicum like um, moot court for lawyers, internship and residency for doctors, an architect's uh, design studio for architects, even some of the studio classes you or, or capstone classes you have as engineers or computer scientists. And in the practicum, you do things that a professional really does, and then you step back and systematically reflect on them with your peers and mentors. And these cycles of action and reflection on action build this mature way of thinking of a professional. In other words, the, pra the job of the practicum is to create this epistemic frame. And what this means is that we can use these kinds of practices to build games that help people learn the epistemic frames of engineering or, architect or architecture or presumably business leadership as well. I'm just going to give you a quick example. Um, and I'm giving the example not necessarily because I'm particularly trying to promote this example, but because it exemplifies this idea that it's not just the isolated skills, knowledge, values, and so forth, but the way they're connected that creates the, creates the frame. So here's a game that we happen to develop called Urban Science, where players become urban planners. Um, urban planning is a great example of the kind of innovative thinking that IBM is talking about. Urban planners have to analyze problems, visualize futures, compare alternatives, describe implications. They have to be competent and creative and so forth. This is just a short list here. Um, in the game, players become urban planners. They work for an urban planning firm. They have an email inbox where they exchange emails with colleagues, where they talk about work projects and products that are due. They use the same, uh, they uh, go on a site visit where they meet with um, clients and stakeholders and find out what people in the community want and need. They use professional planning tools to um, come up with uh, possible planning alternatives. They take those back to the, the planning alternatives back to the stakeholders and get feedback. Eventually they build out a three-dimensional model of the redesign of the city and then they present, they have, uh, include a justification for why that's a particularly good uh, way to redesign the city. Um, what I'm interested in, in just giving you that brief sketch though, uh, is that what we care about in a game like this is the skills and knowledge, and is that coming through? Yeah, the skills and knowledge and identity and values and epistemology that players create when they play the game. And we're interested not just in whether they get the skills, whether the skills are there, or whether the knowledge is there, but how they're linked together. And in particular, whether the way that the mentors, the experts in the game, in the practicum, and the players, have the same linkage. So what we're going to watch here is just two quick movies, okay? And I'm not going to explain a lot about how they were created, although I'm happy to say a bit in questions and I'm happy to talk afterwards as well. But what you're going to see on one side is the mentor's frame as it is used through the game. And on the other side, you're going to see the player's frames as it's developed through the game. Now you'll notice that at first there's only a few elements of this frame that come together. But as the game progresses, the mentors add more and the players add more. The frames look sim similar at the beginning. We'll see they start to diverge, the epistemology, which is that orange dot, moves out. But now we'll see that for the mentors, the epistemology comes back in a little bit sooner. The players, that's identity that's kind of bouncing in and out. They're kind of playing with their professional identity at this point in the game. But if we let the movie run, uh, run through to the end, you'll start to see in a moment epistemology is coming back down for the players. Right. If we run the movie through to the end, oops, one more press, both the frames look pretty similar. Now we can actually do more than just say that they look similar. We can quantify the shape of those frames by measuring what are, what's the most central and the next most central and the next most central element of the frame. What's most important? What's the next most important? Which things are most tightly linked together and so forth? Um, so here's a graph showing that. Not surprisingly, the skills and knowledge are at the top. That's the most central thing because you have to do a lot and know a lot to do it. But if we look for the mentors, values become central pretty quickly and then they level off at a fairly high level in the frame. The players' values follow the mentors' values pretty closely. Next for the mentors is epistemology and following that again is the players. 
And finally, identity shows the same pattern. In other words, we can quantify the fact that what's happening in this game is that the players aren't just getting the elements of this practice, the pieces, they are getting that, but they're getting them in the similar configuration to the way that the mentors get them. In other words, this is a game that's starting to develop for these players a particular way of thinking, in this case the way of thinking of urban planning. Oh, uh, and I actually I forgot to mention that the players who are doing this are middle school kids. Um, now my point here um, isn't to trash World of Warcraft or to suggest that in fact there's nothing good that can come of World of Warcraft. No, quite the contrary, um, uh, and, and not for the purposes of learning or for purposes of leadership. Quite to the contrary though, what I am suggesting is that if we want to build games that develop particular ways of thinking, we actually have to think about the way those ways of thinking are constructed. And it's not enough to simply identify elements over here that also happen to exist over here. We have to look systematically at the relationships between them and whether those same relationships hold, whether those skills are enmeshed in the same kinds of activities, the same kinds of values, the same ways of making decisions and justifying actions. Um, that's ultimately, uh, this level of the, the epistemic frame is ultimately something that, that our research shows does transfer from one setting to another. But the 50 years of research in cognitive science suggests that isolated skills and isolated pieces of knowledge just don't transfer well at all. Um, so it's not that surprising in some ways that IBM is seeing some of the kinds of results that they're seeing. Um, yeah, I don't need that slide. Uh, uh, some of you may know I have a book that describes some of these ideas in more detail, but for those of you who can't wait, there's a website, epistemicgames.org, that talks about this game and some of these ideas and also has blog entries about uh, other topics that, are, that, that these issues touch on. Um, so I hope I did that quickly enough. Um, I'm happy to entertain a couple questions. Um, thank you very much. Excellent. I was uh, massively impressed. Uh, questions? I think we've got a few. Uh, yeah, you're probably expecting this one, but I don't understand at all how you quantify knowledge in, on a graph. Epistemology. Sure. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm, again, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that, but essentially what, we're do what those graphs are showing is looking at what players are saying and doing during the game, and we're identifying places where they're saying or, or using p particular pieces of knowledge or particular skills from urban planning. Um, and if you look over the whole game, kind of moment by moment, um, we're looking to see when a piece of knowledge is used together with a piece of skill, and we're, um, that we're making a connection between them. And essentially what those graphs are doing is summing those connections over time. And they're showing the things that are more closely connected as being closer on the graph. So for those of you who are familiar with social network analysis, um, this is the same technique except instead of the actors in the network being people, the actors are the elements of the epistemic frame. Um, so imagine for, for a minute, uh, for those of you who don't know social network analysis, if, if we were having a cocktail party and none of us knew each other. And every minute, we took a picture of the party and looked who, at who was talking to each other. Well, the people who were in more of those photographs talking to one another, we would think had a stronger social relationship. And if we looked over time at the number of times that I was talking to somebody else, we could measure how, what my social relationships looked like. We're just doing the same thing, but with the elements of the epistemic frame. And if you want more details, I'm, I'm happy to give them after, but I don't, I don't want to, so I want to have a whole methodological discussion. Um, anyone else? Oh, another one. Hi, David. Harold Warmling from uh, Delft University. Just a quick question. You touched upon the problem of transfer. Yeah. Um, I, I guess in, in World of Warcraft or even line, this also can be a problem if you want to argue that these virtual worlds are very interesting for leadership and stuff. When players say, well, this is just a game and we do this for fun, why is this of interest to real life organizations? Does your framework for epistemic games give a, an answer to why these players perhaps think that because they haven't gone through the whole process perhaps? Well, the short answer is it, no, it doesn't address that so directly. But, um, you know, what's happening, what's happening in games like urban science is we're deliberately taking, well, so let me take one step back. Any game creates an epistemic frame. Any game is about a particular culture. It's about a particular way of thinking. The question is, is it a way of thinking that we care about very much? And is it a way of thinking that's very close to something in the, in the real world? 
the power of a game like this, of, of an epistemic game, is that what we're deliberately doing is picking an epistemic frame that we actually think has some social value to the players. Um, and so we're, in a sense, avoiding some of that problem by making something that's valuable outside of the game also valuable inside of the game and giving, them a, uh, giving players a chance to learn it. Um, part of the reason that works is that, uh, especially for middle school students and high school students and even for undergraduates and perhaps research master students, um, one of the things that, that people are interested as they come into the working world is understanding who they are and what they can do and how the world works. And these are games that give them a little glimpse of that. World of Warcraft gives people a glimpse of how a, an alternative world can work. And it can be very powerful for that. It's just the, the transfer is harder from that situation to a situation that's going to be, more, that's going to be valuable in, in the workplace. Excellent. Thank you. Um, someone else? Oh, we got another one. Is this uh, from somebody in Second Life? Hi, this is from Kaniya Sunshu in Second Life. Um, question is, if virtual reality is advanced, I can easily see these techniques being incorporated as fundamental el education of children and, and adolescents, replacing schools. Um, what are your views on that? That would be great. <laughs> um, I, I should say, by the way, I'm not sure that, that virtual reality is the, is the uh, thing that's holding us back from that, in the sense that um, in a, a game like, the, like urban science that I was showing you, the virtual reality is, in fact, the room that the kids are in when they're playing the game. What they're seeing on the screen doesn't necessarily have to be avatars for them to become an urban planner. What they're seeing when they sit at their screen is the same thing that the urban planner would see on his or her desktop. That makes the desk the urban planner's desk, and it makes the chair the urban planner's desk chair, and it makes the, identity ba the, you know, the ID badge that they wear from the firm a real urban planner's identity badge. Um, so virtual, it's not virtual reality, it's actually the imaginations of parents and teachers and school boards and governments and funding agencies that are holding us back from that vision. Um, uh, I, just I, we should probably to, wrap up, I think. I yeah, we probably <laughs> should, generating too many questions. I just wanted to make one comment, though. Yeah. Um, one thing that I've often looked for is a way to use the environment to do something different. What you seem to be presenting is the way planners would do it now, but is there no way to have an advantage of a virtual environment that shows something uniquely to that environment? Well, it uh, depends on whose perspective you're looking at this from. Um, most of, the, most of the, the eight year olds that I know don't actually have a chance to do this. It is something different right. for them. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I was so, actually thinking and, for and, anybody, but yes. Right, and, and so that's, that's particularly powerful. And, and in fact, um, this, many of the same things would be true of people working at all levels in a, in a corporation. This gives you, if you're working in the engineering department, an opportunity to start to uh, learn to think the way your client, some of your clients think, or vice versa. Um, so the fact that it's something that exists in the world doesn't mean that it exists in the world for every person in the world. No, I understand that. that it was just another way, but I can talk yeah. to you about that after. Um, I guess I'll introduce myself this time. I'm Philip Barcudo, a master's student, Utrecht yeah. University. Well, I was just going to make a comment that with this game, Urban Science, it's kind of like it's a very specific task, you know. It's like it's like training in a flight simulator, in a sense, you know. I think, but I think for for something as abstract as leadership, I'm not sure you can really design such a. Well, I think. It, well, <laughs> I mean, I just gave a presentation of it, so. No, no, I, I, I think I, I think I understand your question. Um, so my answer back is I actually don't think there's something as abstract as leadership. I think that that like with all skills, leadership is is situational. Um, somebody who's a leader in one domain isn't necessarily a leader in every domain. Um, there, are gonna, there are certain uh, ways in which you may understand one domain well enough to be a leader, but you could take somebody who is a good leader in one place and they might fail under a, either a different set of social circumstances or even just a different task. Um, and so part of the power is in the specificity. Now that doesn't mean that you can only ever train to be you know, a leader in this room on this day. Um, but it does mean that the, the domain of leadership may be more circumscribed than your question is suggesting. Wouldn't, wouldn't that, though, suggest that people who do like combat training in virtual uh, environments have no real value at all? Oh, no, no. It depends on the vir what the virtual environment looks like. Okay. Um, so there can be a relationship. Yes, it doesn't yes. exclude it. Yes, okay. of course. I guess that's it. Uh, uh, one more. <laughs> well, I, 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 I really don't. I don't want, we have a lot of other speakers, and I didn't want to. I don't want to. Um, is it a second lifer? Yeah. Okay. 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 Last Fair one. Enough. I think it's important. Um, it's not a question by Karl Um After the urban planning is done, 
in this 3D world. Can you hand over the project managers in construction? Can you hand over the plan what's made for construction to project managers? Uh, can you just repeat it? I just want to make sure I understood the question. Um, after the urban planning is done in this 3D game, yeah. um, can the result be handed over to project managers to do something with it? Uh, well, probably if they were uh, if they were 13-year-old project managers, I think anybody anybody older probably wouldn't want to do it. But um, the and we've had uh, players who play the game and actually present the plans to the to the mayor. Um, and the last time that happened, the mayor actually started asking them for advice about other other planning projects in the city. Um, I think he was partly just doing it to be nice. But um, so uh, so there is there is some sense in which these are these are plans for a real city which might actually get enacted someday. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you.